And then if our modern idea of what a political system is or what a government is isn't truly the natural way that humans function in their political sphere, um, it had to come from somewhere. So I just want to go over really quickly where our modern idea of politics actually came from. So during the Enlightenment from um, the mid-1600s to the 1800s, um, there was a lot of social change and disorder going on. So a lot of things were changing, things felt very disorganized, and we had two different schools of thought or responses to this disorder. You had Hobbes who said um, that life is nasty, brutish, and short, and that a monarch is necessary to keep everyone in line and keep everything under control. And then you had Locke who said um, that we have to exist with these social contracts and there has to be some rule of law. And this idea of this social contract, <clears throat> this basic individual, that basic individual rights are recognized, um, this is our justification for modern, modern politics. Excuse me. So that comes from Locke's idea of the social contract or the rule of law. And that's where our modern idea of politics in the Western world comes from. So it isn't this natural way that human politics function. It's actually um, a response to a lot of social change and um, reorganization that was happening um, during the Enlightenment. We also kind of see um, a connection and shift between um, politics and colonialism. So remember that we talked about colonialism as starting to develop anthropology. It's one of our three factors that influence the development of anthropology. And um, we learned about, Europeans learned about other types of governments, especially non-formal governments, um, through colonialism. Um, generally, these were seen kind of along the same lines as everything else. We interpreted those societies as, um, we saw, they saw this as um, primitive or uncivilized political or governmental organization. And so kind of force the European form of government on other societies. Okay, and they needed to kind of understand what was happening in the culture previous to their engagement there. And so, again, this is where anthropologists come in to start studying these societies um, that don't have formal governments or these acephalous societies or societies with a very different political sphere um, than Europeans were used to at the time. And so this study of different types of political organizations and anthropology led to the development of four different types. So the first is the band. Um, band are, band societies are small, nomadic, self-sufficient groups, usually 25 to 150 people, and they focus on face-to-face -face relationships and they're egalitarian. So um, these are just basic characteristics of a band. Next up would be a tribe. These are generally pastoralist or horticulturalist. So um, instead of hunters and gatherers, a tribe generally is going to be people who are raising their own food um, or are raising animals. Um, tens or thousands of people have a stable leadership, but it's still egalitarian. And they're focusing on reciprocal exchange to kind of maintain social relationships. Next would be a chiefdom. There's generally a hereditary leader who has authority. And so what we mean by hereditary leader is that when that individual dies, power is passed on to his son. Okay. Um, there's a class of high-ranking elites that surround this hereditary leader. So we've lost this egalitarian nature that we see with bands and tribes. There is some informal law, um, not um, very formal law like we'll see in the next category, but um, beginning to see some laws created as opposed to um, relying on um, informal social control like we saw with the Kung Society. Um, and then there's tens of thousands of people, so you're getting a lot more people in one place, which is also going to bring about the beginning of intensive agriculture, so um, a lot of farming instead of just farming for yourself, you're farming for neighbors, and you're farming collectively. And then you've got the state. The state is going to be the most complex political organization. They see a lot of intensive agriculture. There's a lot of social stratification. So remember when we talked about social stratification in terms of class societies or caste societies, you'll see that in state um, political organizations. And then you also have a very centralized authority and the um, focus on very formal laws. Okay, and so you get this kind of idea of 
band tribes, chiefdom, and state. And what this can sometimes wrongly imply is that there's a hierarchy or there is an evolutionary component where you're seeing movement from one to the next to the next. And that's not really true. So what we're trying to do as anthropologists with this is just begin to categorize different societies, um, put them into groups, not necessarily ranking them, not necessarily saying one is better or best, but just starting to organize the different types of organization we see. And by in order to do that, we're linking characteristics. So we're linking um, small nomadic groups to egalitarian societies. So we're linking those two cultural characteristics. With the state, we're linking intensive agriculture um, to complexity, and we're linking social stratification to centralized authorities. So we're linking these characteristics to kind of create what's known as ideal types. And so an ideal type isn't saying that this is what everyone should strive to. It's just saying that if we were to create um, an average of a group of societies that we consider a banned society, it would look like this. And so it's important to remember that these aren't discrete categories. Um, they're not moving from one to the next. What these are, these are just ways to categorize. And then there's infinite levels in between. So it's a continuum um, from less complex to more complex, from band to state. But there aren't lines in between. There aren't stark lines. These are more like checkpoints along the way. Uh, like along the continuum as opposed to boxes that every society will fit into. Um, so it's important to remember that this is a continuum and this is not used to rank societies um, any or anything like that. It's, it's just a way for us to begin to categorize and, and link characteristics of different societies.